Once I read this book, I realized that I really wanted to have a conversation about pigeons as these important non-human inhabitants of the city. Um, and to think about the ways in which they can um, help us think about the city differently by looking at them, looking at how we interact with them, looking at how they interact with us and our environment, etc. Um, so, Colin Joel, that author of this book, which is, it really is that rare thing, which is an academic book you want to keep reading. Um, he's assistant professor of sociology and environmental studies at NYU. And uh, he just, just led us, on, many of us, on a, a very exciting pigeon walk. And I think we do not see a single pigeon at <laughs> hear me say it, say it, they like to roost an hour, an hour and a half before dusk, so our tour was just a little bit That's too excuse, late. Too but I think you've all seen pigeons, so... Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't come on the walk to see your first pigeon. <laughs> so the, the format of this is I get to ask a couple questions, and then, um, then I let you guys start jumping in, too. And if you don't have questions, I just keep going for a little bit. And if you do, you take over. So that's that's how this is going to go. I, and I, I just wanted to start off with, because although we were talking for the most part about feral pigeons, and street pigeons, and how people interact with them on the street, uh, a good two-thirds of Colin's book is actually concerned with two other sorts of pigeons, um, and one of which is the, the, the rooftop coop. Um, I guess, what's the name for them? The stocks? They fly stocks and they call it flying stock birds. They call themselves pigeon flyers sometimes. So, so in the book, you, you spend a lot of time with these folks out in, in Brooklyn. And I guess I had a couple of questions. One uh, is, is sort of like, how, how are these, these pigeons different from normal pigeons? And two, also, how do they, what role do they play? So we spend a lot of time on the walk talking about how pigeons, feral pigeons, interact with the city. Do these pigeons have a different role? Yeah, so, um, so pigeon breeding of some variety or another for leisure has been going on for thousands of years. Um, you know, as soon as people figured out that pigeons have this homing instinct, that you can send them far away and they can find their way back. Uh, of course, that made them useful as messengers. It also meant that you could race them. That you could, you know, send them. Some, you, you could take all the pigeons somewhere and fly back because every bird comes home first. Um, these tumblers are a breed of pigeon that actually can do backward somersaults in, in mid in mid air. Darwin speculated that this came about by breeding pigeons that were prone to seizures. So it's an exaggerated seizure. But so then they're in the Middle East in particular, they have competitions of tumbling pigeons. Uh, and then they bred a variety of pigeon called a template, which some people in Brooklyn keep. The thing about the template is endurance. They, they have these contests where how long the pigeon can fly continuously in circles in the air. And someone, a judge, comes to your house or your coop and watches. And it's like 24, 27, 28 hours. So it's, the judges have to do shifts, um, just sit there and watch them. And, um, but so, there, and it's generally, so there's a lot of cultures that do this, but how it wound up in New York was uh, mostly ethnic white immigrants brought them here. Uh, people from Belgium, Italy, Germany, and so they brought homing pigeons, which they race, and then they also brought uh, this other, they also brought other breeds of pigeons, some of which I've mentioned. And, and there, there's this game in, in there's this, there was this game, I don't know if it still goes on or not, but there was this game in some places in Italy where the goal was you put your stock of pigeons up in the sky and you fly them, and other people put their stock of pigeons up in the sky, and you're trying to steal the birds. You hope that the stocks mingle, and when yours come back, you've caught some pigeons off them. And so, uh, modern Italy in particular is where this is, there, there's, this is known, this was known in the history of it. So, some of the Italians that came here just started doing this, breeding these pigeons for this 
thieving, in form of thieving competition. And, but they bred a new variety called a New York Flight, because it was first bred in New York City, which became the kind of standard for this rooftop game. If you look at old depictions of New York City, working class New York, so on the waterfront, it's not just Marlon Brando, it's most of the other Italian mafioso were keeping pigeons. And in the rooftop scenes, you can see these rooftop coops all around. And so it used to be relatively popular. Um, and so they, you know, they bred a variety of pigeon that was kind of adapted to the, the, the density of New York, that wanted to fly more upwards and less outwards, so that it was less likely to get lost and mixed with other people's pigeons. And so this is a flight. And then there's just aesthetic preferences, which are just like a poodle or a German Shepherd or anything that people just like, that become the standards. So flights ought to be a solid color. They could be black, white, orange, bluish, it doesn't matter. But this, the breed is one solid color, so they don't have the bars. White wingtips, orange beaks, not gray beaks. White eyes, not orange eyes. And so while the guys are trying to steal the pigeons from each other, and they're up on their rooftops in Brooklyn and Queens. They're also gaining or losing status based on how the aesthetics of the birds and how much they live up to the standards of the breed. So now, if you've got a stock of pigeons up, we're talking about a lot of pigeons, 300, 400, 700, 1,000. I knew a dude that had 1,200 of them. And so it's kind of like a cold war, because if, it's, if a person has 500, you only have 200, their stock's going to overwhelm yours in the sky, and yours are all going to follow theirs back. But they, they know who the owners are because they've got these bands around the legs that identify the owners. So you know who you caught the birds off of. And, they, and so it's bad enough that somebody catches your birds. They go down to the pet shop and hang out and shoot the shit and put the bands down and see who caught pigeons off of who. But also, it's even worse if they caught your pigeons and you have what they call garbage birds. They don't live up to the standards of the breed, right? They have a black mark on their orange beak. They have bars on their wings, but they're not supposed to have bars. And so that's part of just what actually becomes part of the subculture by which you gain or lose status, is how well your birds fly or don't fly. Um, and so the, the funny thing is that, and it's the same with the guys who keep homing pigeons, um, they don't give a crap about street pigeons. If anything, they also dislike street pigeons like a lot of other people because they're afraid that these pigeons might give their pigeons diseases, which is actually somewhat of a legitimate concern. Um, and that if people get upset about them keeping pigeons on the roof, it's because they hate street pigeons and what street pigeons do by like crapping all over the place. And so um, it doesn't generalize as far as them having a general interest in other pigeons. There's actually not that much overlap between the homing pigeon world and what's called the kind of pigeon wars or rooftop pigeon thieving world either. Um, one of the things I thought was curious is that although uh, this started as very much an Italian tradition, um, I think in the book you sort of talk about how as parts of Brooklyn have gentrified and different people have moved into town, the, the way the way that pigeons are sort of being a bridge between different ethnic yeah. groups. I wonder if you could talk about that a little. Definitely. Um, so a curious thing that it, it, it took me a while before I noticed it, but so, you know, I was hanging out with these guys who fly pigeons, and they're pretty diverse. They're white, uh, they're, they're Hispanic, they're black. Most of the whites were of Italian heritage. Most of the uh, Hispanics were Puerto Rican, although not all. We're, we're talking about a small group anyway. We were talking about like 75 people, not that many people. But it took me a while before I noticed that um, almost all the white people were older, 50 plus, a lot of them 75 plus, 85 plus. And that a lot, although not all, of the men of, of the people of color that were getting pigeons were younger, in their 40s, 30s, 20s. And so, you know, that was just curious to me. I wondered why it was that most of the white people were old, most of the people of color were younger. Um, and so it really took me a while to piece together what this story was and how it's really a story about neighborhood change. Um, so when I started to interview the Hispanic and the black guys who keep pigeons, they all had a relatively similar story. It was something to the effect of, well, you know, I moved into this neighborhood. And, and to them, it was unremarkable. Like, they would just say, you know, I saw these guys with pigeons on their roofs. And I thought it was interesting. I was a 10-year-old boy, and so I started talking to them. And they said, hey, you want, you know, for a, a buck a week, you know, I'll give you a buck a week if you clean my coops or fly the birds while I'm at work to train them. And then I would say, what was the name of this person? Oh, Joe Morocco, Salvatore, you know, whatever. Like, the, all the names that they were telling me were Italian, almost all of them. 
And so then I started, to, so what happened, I kind of pieced this together then. I, I, taught, I looked at the neighborhoods they were moving into, like Bushwick and Bed-Stuy in the 50s and 60s. And so I pieced together what happened. And it's kind of an interesting story. Um, so if you take Bushwick, which is the neighborhood where I lived in when I did this research, in 1950, it was almost 100% white. By the 2000 census, it was less than 3% white. And what happened was, so a lot of these guys who were flying pigeons, their friends did it, and then, but they, you always need help. If you're keeping 600 pigeons, you generally would enlist your son, who just has to help you, uh, or you hire some kid from the neighborhood. Well, they had a very practical problem. So their kids and their co-ethnic peers moved to the suburbs, Jersey, Long Island. They still had to have somebody help them clean up the shit and fly the birds when they were at work. So they started recruiting the boys who moved in, who were Puerto Rican and black. And so then they grew up to be pigeon flyers and have started, some of them have passed it on to their kids. So what's really interesting is, is you see this, this happen in the neighborhoods like Canarsie, Bushwick, Bed-Stuy, where this racial changeover was anything but peaceful. I mean, there was a lot of really violent racial and ethnic conflict, but you find this really interesting community of people that formed that's cross-generational and cross-racial through pigeon flying. And it's not that none of these guys are ethnocentric, and that includes the whites as well as the men of color, but to the extent that they invest their identity in pigeon flying, and most of them are really invested, like hours a day, any of their spare income, on the weekend they're visiting rooftops, um, Whatever race or ethnicity you are has no bearing on your status as a pigeon flyer with everybody else. And so it's not anything that's relevant as far as your standing in the group, right? And so it, you wind up forming this community of people where you're so involved in pigeon flying, and status is not something you own. Status is conferred to you by other people. So this old Italian has to care about what the young black guy from Bed-Stuy thinks about him. And he wants him to respect him and his birds, you know? And so you wind up forming this community of people who, in the other spheres of their lives, they lead incredibly racially segregated lives. The bars they hang out at, the places they eat and shop, but this is the one sphere of their life where, you know, they've got these cross-racial ties. And how is that changing, or is it, as places like Bushwick and Bed-Stuy are increasingly being gentrified, I guess? It's, yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess you're more likely to get a backyard chicken now than... Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so the you know pigeon, pigeon rooftop pigeon flying is is declining, and um, I have to say I think it would be declining even if gentrification wasn't happening. Um, there's just so many more things competing for people's times, from more organized sports and clubs to video games to what have you. Um, and so I don't want to blame all of urban rooftop who decline on gentrification. That said, uh, in the time that I was writing about these guys, I came to know seven or eight, I can't remember now, different guys who got kicked off of the rooftops in Williamsburg as the neighbor gentrified. And there's, there's a couple of things about this. So one is, a lot of these guys didn't own their own houses. So what would they do is they lived in a tenement, and in exchange with the landlord for tarring the roof every couple of years, or what have you, they would be allowed to keep the birds. But now the building was sold to somebody else who turned it into condos. So they just, you know, the new owner's like, uh, no, we're not going along with this, you know. Um, the other thing is just even people, this gets into the general loathing and disgust about pigeons. New neighbors move in, they see pigeons nesting on their windowsill. In most instances, these are feral pigeons, but they don't know or care about the difference. They see 500 pigeons on the roof next to them, and they say, ah, oh, these guys are making, you know, causing this problem. Whereas if there's neighborhood stability, people that know their neighbors often know that the pigeon is causing them potential problems are not the same. But so people call 311 or whoever else, and when they come and investigate, if they do, they call sanitation or a health department. It's, it's legal to have a pigeon coop, but many people, they're not up to fire code. Um, you know, and that would cost, building a coop that way would cost a lot of money. A lot of these guys just either don't have the money or they built a coop a long time ago. They're keeping more pigeons than you're legally allowed to keep. And so they can get fined or kicked off the rooftops. And so um, as, as neighborhoods are changing over and gentrifying, so now Bushwick is going the opposite way. Um, now I think the census figures, it was 3% white in, in 2000, the 2010 census. It was like 13 or 14. It's probably more than that by now. And that's probably an undercount, but you know, by, by 2020 it'll be probably 50, 60 percent white. Um, that that uh, and that you know these guys are getting are getting squeezed out. Um, and, and one of the interesting things that I write about in the conclusion of my book is that um, 
in some ways, one could say this is a simple story of, of cleaning up cities from, you know, we don't have slaughterhouses in the city anymore. We got rid of that to other places. You don't kill animals, and we don't want to deal with animal defecation and whatever else in the built environment. So part of it just seems like, oh, yeah, this is part of the sanitization, cleaning up of urban spaces. But on the other hand, we've got this impulse of breeding cities. Uh, we're not only trying to build more green spaces, but there's this whole local food sustainability, the beehives, the chicken coops. Um, and, and so there's this whole phenomenon that it seems like, well, why isn't there room for rooftop coops in that? Um, and what's interesting about that is, so there's not, it seems. And in some of the, so in some of the same neighborhoods in Brooklyn where gentrification has resulted in rooftop coops disappearing, there's the rise of backyard or rooftop chicken coops and beehives. And in places like, so Chicago actually made it illegal to keep pigeons in the city at the same time that they overturned their ban on rooftop beehives and affirmed that you could keep even roosters in the backyard. And what happened was is there was a whole movement, like there is in New York, of largely, not exclusively, but largely upper middle class people that frame this as part of local food, sustainability, forward thinking green cities. And unfortunately for these guys who fly pigeons, um, you know, they, they don't have the same political clout. It's not part of local food or anything like that. And so, um, I mean, it's funny, in Chicago, I interviewed the, uh, the alderman who was in charge of leading the rooftop coop band, and he said to me, you know, it's just so backward. I mean, keeping pigeons, you know, that's such a 19th century thing. You know, we don't keep goats and livestock in the backyard anymore. But meanwhile, there's this whole phenomenon going on where City Hall installed beehives on its own roof, you know? And so there's this whole class disparity in who it is that's involved in these different activities and the moral narrative they can tie it to that unfortunately the pigeon flyers come out on the wrong end of. what an invasive species in New York City means, where, you know, where we've pretty much obliterated any green and are now just trying to artificially install some green on it. I mean, really, it's a challenging question. Central Park is um, a magnet for migrating bird populations. Right. So it's just about the memory Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think it's a good question. I want to separate it for a minute from the rooftop pigeons versus the street pigeons. Because, um, so with the rooftop pigeons, Every once in a while, some of the rooftop pigeons leave and join the stray population. But it's pretty rare. Uh, most pigeon, most domestic pigeons have bands on their legs, so look for bands on street pigeons, on pigeons, and you'll, you'll almost never find it. I've seen a, a dozen in the time I'm going around looking for it. So it doesn't mean that people should have a concern about them, but the thing is that most of the guys fly their birds for about an hour a day at a designated time, and they fly them hungry. That's their benefit. The way they get the birds home is they put the flag down, so they chase them with these poles. With the, and then they put the flag down and toss feed on the roof, and the birds come back. So what that means is they're not really out that much. They're really just up in the sky, high. Like, they, they, they don't, the guys don't want them. They don't let them fly low and land on people's rooftops and all that. And they fly them hungry, so they're not crapping that much except right on the roof when they bring them down. And so I think the important thing is trying to figure out as far as whether they're a nuisance um, versus, and certainly if it's just one or two chickens, but if it's a dozen or two dozen and there's some roosters in there, if they're bees, my brother's neighbors have bees in Philadelphia. My brother can't use his backyard. And it's cool, I'm not even against bees in the city, but it's like, when they, it's changed the way they use their backyard because the bees don't want to stay where they are. And I'm like, okay, if their neighbors had a rooftop coop, it would be less invasive to my brother. Than having. So anyway, that's one thing. Your other question, which I think is is, is quite interesting about whether pigeons can keep. Um, I don't think there's a. I talked to the Audubon Society about this, and they don't seem to think that they do. I'm not a biologist. This is my problem. I'm a sociologist, so I admit, like, when I actually run up against these kind of questions, some people get disappointed because compared to like biologists, I don't know jack about pigeons or ecology. But when I talked to the Audubon Society, their stance on pigeons was. Well, we don't care about them. 
And so if people are killing them and poisoning them or capturing them, they're not native. So that's the distinction we make. Non-native, we don't care. So if somebody, if, if they saw people ripping heads off of pigeons, they wouldn't do it. They don't care. But they don't really see them as competing because pigeons, naturally pigeons want to eat grain. It's not the kind of grain really growing around here, like wheat and other stuff. Pigeons in the city are generally eating garbage or people's scraps, like bread and all that, um, or feet, see that people are buying. The question that, that Audubon Society is more worried about is these flyover birds eating, becoming, um, becoming more like pigeons, stop migrating because there's bread that people are feeding them. They see garbage and see the pigeons eating garbage, they're like, oh crap, we can do that. Why take off after a week? You know, we can stay here. And so I think biologists, or at least the people I've talked to, are more concerned about these native animals becoming more like pigeons, right? And becoming unnatural in what it is they want to eat and their migratory patterns. Something you said actually, I have another question, just so I'm back that's totally unrelated. But when you mentioned decapitating pigeons, um, I used to live in Central Paris, and I swear I would see roasted pigeons that had no stomachs sort of lying open sometimes on the bridges. It was really strange. And I assumed that people were eating the pigeons. Do you, have you come across any, any like, people who catch and eat wild pigeons? It's so crazy. Uh, I, I have I mean, you know, it's kind of, you can't help but think it's funny, but it, it is sad. I mean, if, particularly if you actually witness it, but I've witnessed what, whatever you want to call them, pigeon abductions. Uh, there are people that make money off of putting nets out on the ground, and they put dump a bunch of seed, and when the pigeons land, they pull the net. And I cannot confirm that these pigeons are being sold for consumption. I've heard rumors. I can confirm, I will not name sources, that they are sold to gun clubs in Pennsylvania where they shoot them and have pigeon shoot. So, but as far as Paris or even more generally, I've never met anyone or confirmed people catching pigeons to eat. There was a case in Trafalgar Square in London where a guy was catching pigeons and people got really upset. This was before the ban on feeding when there was a pigeon seed vendor there and he said he was catching them to eat them. So I, it probably happened. When I actually told my uh, parents, my parents live in London, when I told them that uh, I was doing this event, um, my father said that during the war, actually, uh, the Second World War, um, pigeon eating was, particularly in the East End of London, was sort of a, whether it was a, I mean, my dad's too young to have been alive then and he wasn't eating pigeons, so, but it could well have been an urban myth, but, <laughs> but the urban myth was that pigeons were being eaten, so. Exactly, sure. Uh, first question, no. Um, they were not keeping them for food, as far as I know, anyway. The, the history that I can find is for leisure. Um, particularly if you think of, you know, back in the day when a lot of people lived in walk-up tenements with no air conditioning. As I, I think I said on, on, the, on the tour, um, I've witnessed, I mean, you know, it's kind of, you can't help but think it's funny, but it, it is sad. I mean, particularly if you actually witness it, but I've witnessed whatever you want to call them, pigeon abductions. Uh, there are people that make money off of putting nets out on the ground and they put dump a bunch of seed and when the pigeons land, they pull the net. And I cannot confirm that these pigeons are being sold for consumption. I've heard rumors. I can confirm, I will not name sources, that they are sold to gun clubs in Pennsylvania where they shoot them and have pigeon shoot. So, but as far as Paris or even more generally, I've never met anyone or confirmed people catching pigeons to eat. There was a case in Trafalgar Square in London where a guy was catching pigeons and people got really upset. This was before the ban on feeding when there was a pigeon seed vendor there and he said he was catching them to eat them. So it probably happens. When I actually told my uh, parents, my parents live in London, when I told them that uh, I was doing this event, um, my father said that during the war, actually, uh, the Second World War, um, pigeon eating was, particularly in the East End of London, was sort of a, whether it was a, I mean, my dad's too young to be alive and he wasn't eating pigeons, so, but it 
could well have been an urban myth, but, but the urban myth was the pigeons are being eaten. So. Yep. Um, first, a trivial question, and hopefully uh, emerging on. Would people can they start having groups in the rooms uh, to raise them for food in New York? And then the more important question, you've talked about racial desegregation, but it seems to me as though there's pure gender segregation from what you talked about. So if you keep saying men do this, but yeah, the sun's that not. Exactly. Sure. Uh, first question, no. Um, they were not keeping them for food. As far as I know, anyway, the, the history that I can find is for leisure. Um, particularly if you think of, you know, back in the day when a lot of people lived in walk-up tenements with no air conditioning, the roof was generally a place to go to escape. If they weren't doing this, they'd be at the bar or whatever else. But that in and of itself just is their expression of male privilege, right, to be able to do that. Was there a single female pigeon keeper? Yes, uh, there I met, I met two. Uh, one was with a boyfriend for a long time who flew pigeons and got into it because of him. The other one raised pigeon, got into pigeon, basically her husband made her help it. So he's like, well, I'm gonna take the birds to Jersey. I want you to wait and tell me when they come home. And so basically because she, for so long, helped, was like forced to help him do it, she just started racing her own. Um, so there are, and when I've gone to other places, like the Million Dollar Pigeon Race in South Africa, I met some women who, who raised pigeons, but I have yet to meet, I think they exist, but I have yet to meet women who didn't get into it because of their men, right? They just got into it on their own. So you mentioned the Million, million Dollar Pigeon Race, and I, I do, I do want to, um, Use my microphone for the bitches to ask another question. Sure. Um, which is, and to get on to the subject of the, the homing pigeons. Um, and one of the ways you talk about that um, and analyze that in sociological terms is the ritual of training and the sort of superstition that goes with that. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what it is that these switching birds were in the Bronx now, what it is that these guys do to, to train their pigeons and give them supplements and whatnot. Sure. So, um, yeah, so there's probably about seven or eight pigeon racing clubs in New York. And the way that this works is, so if you raise your homing pigeon, if you raise your pigeons on your rooftop, that's where they imprint on, is their home. So if you drive that pigeon to Jersey, Maryland, Ohio, or wherever, and let it loose, it will more likely than not find its way back to your rooftop. Um, the homing instinct is still not well understood by scientists. They know dimensions of it, so they know that pigeons can sense electromagnetic radiation. And you know, there's, a, there's an electromagnetic signature no matter where you are in the world. And so they think that they can sense use, you know, sense electromagnetic radiation to be able to find their way home. They can also see ultraviolet light, which means that they can use the sun as a compass in a much more sophisticated way than we can. Pigeons are loath to fly at night and they're loath to fly in the rain. Both, and the rain affects both seeing ultraviolet light and electromagnetic radiation. So when it rains, they want to go down and wait for the rain to pass. Um, they also can have an extraordinary sense of smell. And so actually, some people think that they can use smell not to find their way all the way home, but to help guide them for the last couple dozen miles. Um, and so, but, so this is something that can, but like anything, they have this natural ability, but it can be enhanced through training. So what the guys do is they start by driving the pigeons just like 10 miles away in North Jersey, let them loose, and they fly back. And then they'll drive to Central Jersey, and then they'll fly to Southern Jersey, and then they'll fly, drive to Pennsylvania. And generally, they won't drive further than 150 miles, although once their pigeons do that routinely and easily, then they'll do races, and the races start at 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles, 400 miles. So the birds are, by the time they've done the 400 mile, they've already done the 300 mile. You get, you get the idea. And the pigeons, this is not a race you watch. We don't go and watch a pigeon race. What you do is they gather at a club. So in the Bronx Club, you have to live in the Bronx, in the territorial boundaries of the Bronx, to be a member of that club. The guys go, they hang out. They all bring their birds. They put the birds on a truck. So they, they, they take them, they put an electronic band on their arm, they scan the band so that the club knows which birds were put in the race and to ensure that you didn't 
cheat and like take a band that you had at home and swipe it. Um, the birds are put on a truck, driven to Ohio, West Virginia, whatever, and the guys, and then they're released the next morning. And the guys wait on the roof. The pigeons can generally do 400 miles in about eight hours. Um, it depends on wind. And the guys wait. And uh, when the pigeons come in, the, the, what they do is nowadays it's electronic. So when the birds come down, you corral them in your coop, and they walk across this threshold of the of the entrance, the coop that scans them like a grocery store, and it scans the arm and the leg band, so it gets the time. Um, the guys also have to do other things. Sometimes the birds don't want to land. The birds don't know they're in a race, so they might come back and land on a neighbor's roof. They're tired. They just sit there and pan. And the guys are like losing their mind. <laughs> so they have these. They, they have they have pigeons that they, they clip the wings and they'll toss the bird and that bird will come up and flutter back down and so it lures the bird. The bird's like, oh, I know him. And so they'll like follow him in, right? So they have these different strategies. Um, and then they do things to try to make the pigeons come home faster because the pigeons don't know they're in the race. So both males and females can sit on the eggs. So they'll take, they'll, they like to raise pigeons that are sitting on eggs because then the pigeon will want to get home to sit on the eggs. But meanwhile, the other, their, their partner is still sitting on the eggs, so the eggs are fine. Uh, the other thing they might do is, they call it widowhood racing, is uh, they only let the pigeons mate when they come home from the race. So right before the race, they put a male and female together, and the guy's going crazy, he does a little ritual, the bobbing and everything. And then right when they're about to copulate, they take the pigeon out <laughs> and put it in the race. And, the, and then the pigeon knows through training that when it gets home, it gets to get it on, and it's the only time it gets to get it on. And so these are some of the strategies they do to try to um, get them to come home faster. And, um, so pigeon, they call, the guys call pigeon racing the poor man's horse racing. It's traditionally, you could just even, you know, train street pigeons to do this. And, um, and when one of these that's happened is it's become, it's becoming professionalized. So now guys are betting money on it, and a lot of them. There are races in New York where the winner gets $50,000. Second place still gets $15,000. There's still $1,000 prizes all the way up to 200th place. Um, and so the stakes are high, actually. Um, but, but so one, and one of the things to get back to your, your question, I mean, the training is really like painstaking. I mean, waking up before dawn, five days a week, driving out, you know, um, to, just, to just pull over on a shoulder on the side of the road and, and drop the pigeon off. But one of the things that I got interested in was how part of the allure for these guys, I mean, one of the things I thought was really interesting was, of course the guys want to win, but even when their pigeons, like, because they're all talking to each other on cell phones, so even when they realize that so many pigeons have come in that they don't have a chance of winning, they still want to wait there, and they're like waiting for that bird. And when the birds come, when they see the bird on the horizon, I mean, it, it takes them over physically. Like, a lot of them, their mouth goes dry. They start shaking when they're, you can see their hands shaking when they <laughs> toss their dropper, as they call the bird they put up, or a Chico, to bring the homer back. And, and when it comes in, there's like, it's like this, uh, you know, it's almost like a, a miracle that happens again and again, right? And I think well, part of the magic for them is that it's, it's kind of nurture versus nature. And even if they didn't win, they've won, they've beaten nature, and that they manipulate aspects of nature. So the mating, the, the, the desire to mate, the desire to sit on eggs. Um, they, you know, but when they send the pigeon away, sometimes they get picked off by hawks. Sometimes they go down if it's raining, and then they just decide to join street pigeons, and they don't want to come back. And so even the bird coming home is, you've trained that bird enough and gotten it prepped enough, or a lot of guys say it loves home enough that it, can, it still came back to you. And so there's this always, every race is like a battle against nature. The guys come up with all of these ways to try to figure out how to basically win, how to, you know, how to make the pigeon want to come home faster. Sometimes it's herbal elixirs and all this other stuff. You know, but, and, then, and then they have, but then it's like anything else, like in the way of baseball, there's this kind of, there's this superstitious aspect, right? The pitcher does these rituals where they tap their hat a couple times, they do all these other things. Well, the guys have all the, once you let the bird loose, there's nothing you can do, right? You just have to wait. But they all have their bizarre rituals and things that they swear by that make them win. And so I write that that's part of the award too, that in a way this is magic. What is magic? 
Magic is the precursor to science. It's ways to try to bring order to a chaotic world that's beyond your control, right? But that, but that, then scientists kind of laugh at the ridiculous magic rituals and superstition because it didn't really work, right? But so these guys have their own magic, their own superstition and rituals that they use because that time, that eight hours of waiting is really, really intense. And there's nothing you can do, it's beyond your control, but the guys want to make it within their control. You know, so that's one of the things that I think is, is so enchanting about this activity. It's not just about the money. Um, even races that, they do have races that aren't really money at all. There's, there's some high stakes races and those races that really aren't worth money. But the allure still seems to be the same, either way. Yeah. I actually have two questions. Uh, one is, does it, do they, you know, use certain sex of religion? Is it male, female, or is it both? That race? Yeah. Oh. Okay, and then also in terms of the history of, you're talking about people driving their pigeons 150 miles away. Yeah. In the earlier days. Trains. I mean, they took trains. Yeah, they would have to And my family didn't have a car. Yeah. So, how did they get? Trains. So, in Europe, like, they, they would do these races where, you know, um, a race from Paris, they would all put their pigeons on trains, and they, you know, the train would go, you know, Germany. And, they, and they'd have agreements, they'd pay the, 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 you know, the conductor to let their birds out. So, like, every day? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, well, they weren't trained as well, and they lost more birds, right? It, was, it wasn't as much in your control. But pigeon racing didn't take off until the Industrial Revolution made it possible for you to find a way to readily transport your bird far away. So we used them as messengers for a heck of a long time. But what they, what they would do is, I should say, major racing. So what there used to be, there's, there's records of in London, people would have really short distance races. They would ride their bicycles across town and let their birds loose and then try to ride their bike really fast or have a partner waiting on the roof for them to come home. So that was what it was limited to until there was trainings. Yeah. How much money do people tend to spend on the pigeon thing Yeah. So, just as a brief aside, so the rooftop guys, not the racers, it can be a substantial amount of money. I mean, you know, if you have a lot of birds, you gotta buy sacks of feed, and they're like 20, 24 bucks a sack, so that's money. But, the more pigeons you catch, the less money it costs you. Because when you go to the pet shop, they have a policy where they'll buy any bird for $2 or give you $3 store credit. So these guys have, they have what they call a prisoner pen where they store the birds they've caught and when they get enough of them, they go to the pet shop and cash it in for store credit. And so if you can make it something that doesn't cost you a lot of money. Um, as far as pigeon racing, it can be serious money. I mean, you know, you see, guys, I saw guys who, for the big races, where you can win a lot of money, the entrance fee is $100 per bird. I saw guys putting 40 birds. You know, that's a lot of money. But if you get even four of those birds back in the top 1,000 and get a $1,000 cash prize, or in the top 150, the top 150 birds get a $1,000 at least cash prize. So if you can get four back, you've broken even. Um, and then there's side bets. So people, there's a $50 betting pool. There's a $10 betting pool. So you can bet, put money on those different ones. So if you have the top bird in the $50 pool, you can win all that money. The top bird in the $10 pool, you can win all that money. So it seems that good racers at least break even. And some of them consistently make money. Um, and, and then the, those that consistently lose money quit, <laughs> in general, to be, to be one. Um, but it seems like most people, you know, at least break even, or it doesn't cost them more than a, an average hobby that somebody else might have. Are there different communities of racers versus rooftop? These activists are two different. Yeah, they are. Um, they mingle at pet shops. There's not that many pet shops that really are focused on pigeon supplies in the city, so they mingle at pet shops. But from what I saw, usually not many other places. So. But the more I traverse these two worlds, it's like, oh, you have to know, when I be in the Bronx, I say, oh, you gotta know about JoJo. He's like a legendary, eight, he's this 89-year-old rooftop pigeon fire. Like, I don't know who JoJo is, you know? And then, like, the same with the guys, you know, in, unless some, I mean, obviously some people switch. So there are people that had rooftop coops and then graduated to racing. So they might know some of those people. But they are pretty distinct. Um, there was only a small number of the guys, the rooftop guys, who knew when, the, like, they, oh, well, you know, the World Trade Center Memorial race is coming up. They're like, oh, 
okay, you know, maybe they saw a flyer for it, but so they are relatively distinct. You mentioned a little bit earlier, you were talking about kind of the relationship that the, uh, the racers have with their pigeons. Can you characterize that relationship a little bit? Is it more kind of like father and children or general and their troops or coach yeah. and their team? That's, that, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's not clear cut. So um, there's this there's this um, masculine performance of not giving a fuck. So for instance, like the rooftop guys, you don't want to lose birds because that means that you did something wrong. But if guys are like if guys publicly are like, man, that was a really good one, then the other guys are like, you know, what the fuck do you think is gonna happen when you put them up? Are you attaching them like pets? What, what, you know, or, or they'll say they're a pussy if they care, you know? And, and, but yet, when I'm on the roof with them, they can be pretty tender. They can talk to them like kids. Um, and I saw a guy that would brag and catch up like, my birds are afraid of me, you know? Um, and I don't give a fuck if, you know, I don't give a fuck if I, if I lose a hundred of them. But then on the rooftop, the birds are obviously not afraid of them. They're landing on them, they're having to eat out of their hand. And so there's this interesting nurturing if you want to call it, and I don't mean this to, to reify it, but like feminine aspect to it that is like cleaning up shit and nurturing and talking baby talk that happens generally in private. And then there's this masculine performance, right? And, and, so, and I think that tension is real. I don't, I don't necessarily think that the public performance is fake either. I think you do. So I think in general, you do have to expect that birds come and go. But there's this attachment to the stock because the stock is a bloodline. So guys that are 85 years old, they have the descendants of pigeons that they bred when they were six years old. You know, and so it's that bloodline. And, and a lot of these guys obsess over like when I die, trying to line up that who's going to take their birds and breed on them so the bloodline carries on. And so there's that kind of. But then you see when the boundaries get crossed, like. Um, Pigeons that win. So what's interesting is so pigeons have numbers. They don't have names. The racing pigeons, they have numbers on the band. But when that pigeon wins the World Trade Center Memorial, guess what happens? It gets its picture taken on a plaque and a name. And so it gets a name. And they all have these plaques with the name of the bird. And from here on out, that bird is generally never raced again because now you breed out. It's a stud pigeon. But it's also is like pampered entirely and they refer to it by name, whatever name they gave it. And some of them, they'll let, like, there's like 19, 21 year old blind pigeons hobbling around that they're hand feeding, <laughs> breaking up the grain and mixing it with water to get it down their throat, that it has become a pet. You know, so they can cross that line. But, but very much I think there is, but a lot of times it is, particularly for the pigeon wars, these rooftop guys, it, a lot of it is this like general and the troops, and they refer to it as their army, and they refer to it as the pigeon wars. But it's kind of more complicated than that. They are, they are aware of the book. Um, you know, the greatest moment was to go back to Broadway Pigeon and Pet Supplies, which is the pet shop in Brooklyn, uh, where I hung out for over three years every damn Sunday, except unless I was away somewhere. And finally, I mean, because this was my PhD thesis before it was a book. So the PhD thesis was like three and a half years. And then I finished that in 2008. It took me three more years to finish the book. It took a year and four months for the finished book to come out in print. So here we are in 2013. This is the year it came out. I started doing it in 2005. Most of them gave up on the book. I mean, they just like, in 2007, they were like, where's the book, man? You've been doing this for two years. Where's the book? And I, so um, finally, just to show them. But what's cool, too, is so one of the things I did, and this won't strike most of you as interesting at all, but in sociology, it's really rare. So in journalism, the standard is these real names and places. That's what you do, unless somebody says, I refuse to put my name on record. And then you have to, make, to make a justification, like so-and-so who, you know, who was not authorized to speak on record. In sociology, those of us who actually talk to people, and I say that because most people do surveys, um, but even those of us who study communities and groups of people, the standard is to use fake names. 
Um, and, and, and part of this is out of a, a, our research has to be vetted by our universities who are concerned about whether our research can possibly have a negative impact. So we have to jump through a hurdle that journalists don't have to. And so anyway, this is kind of a long-winded way to say that I made a choice and fought with my with the ethical review board at my university to use the real names, and I did. And, and the greatest moment was for the guys to, I mean, what does anybody want? And this is, in some ways, what would be disappointing. Most of them don't give a shit about the whole book. They flip through it and look for their name. They go to Google Books and put in their name and see how many times they're referenced and where. And I have pictures, and they are hoping that I have a picture of them. So it was great. I went in, the guys take cell phone pictures of their name on the page, um, you know, their, at this point, to be honest, not that many of them have read it or have read the whole thing. What was edifying, at least, was um, some of them that have read the parts they're in uh, have been very happy and have been supportive. And this is where I really try to balance. I do sociological analysis, but I don't just fit them into typologies and categories. I say who they are. I talk about their personal biography. I describe what it was like on the roof. And actually, so a real edifying moment was this guy, Panama, who I got to know. Um, we, got, we were back in touch a lot because right after the book came out, this guy from the New York Times wanted to write an article about the rooftop coops. And he said to me, uh, you know, I'm not going to write the book, I'm not going to write the piece unless I can get on Panama's roof. The problem was Panama didn't want him on his roof. So I was like begging Panama to let him on the roof. And, in the con and so I sent, and this was like right when the book came out, so I mailed Panama a copy of the book. And he sent me a text at like 4 in the morning, like a day after I shipped it overnight express and said, um, but this is just really edifying because he said, you know, um, I really feel like you got me right. You got the essence of me. And what was great about that was I made claims that weren't directly what he said. So he's, he's a black man, and he talked about some issues about like being black in America and the challenge that they face. But I made arguments about how I thought that experience actually shaped the way he did pigeon flying and the way he related to it. That weren't something he said, like, because I'm black, I think this way, but I, I based on, I inferred based on the, the conversations and interactions I had had with him in other spheres of his life, but I was really nervous about whether he was going to say, why would you say that? that? That has nothing to do with why I fly pigeons. But he felt like, without me reducing him to a black man, which I didn't want to do at all, but saying that there's something about that experience that he actually brings to pigeon flying, he thought, I was right about, and he kind of thought like that's interesting. I never thought about it that way, um, and and so you know, I mean, I mean, some of the guys in the Bronx were like said that I was a little too generous. They're like, no, it's about the money in the competition. <laughs> um, but and the thing is, is maybe they're right. The tough thing is, is like part of the thing about when you do ethnography is that um, you stop believing everything people tell you, and it's not that they're lying, but you sort of think that sometimes you. Have, you observe them in a lot of different contexts, and it seems that some of the things they said to you when you interviewed them are not consistent with a variety of interactions you've seen with them across a variety of situations. And so I don't necessarily want to privilege. I don't want to say it's worthless, but I don't want to privilege what they said to me. So I respect that they said that, and maybe they're right, but I'm not sure that the truth of whether that's really what it's about or not is that easy to get. So. Uh, I mean, we talked a lot about pigeons in New York, but you mentioned in Chicago where they yeah, had yeah. racism, but there was something. And South Africa, they have racism to start, and it will be. Talk a little bit about this world. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, where this international aspect started was I went to Berlin for fun, and I was walking around, and I saw a coup. So, I mean, I'm like, hey, what's going on here? There's a pigeon coop. Right in downtown, um, Kreuzberg. And so, uh, I went up and tried to talk to the guys, like, no, English, no, um, and they were Turkish. They told me they were Turkish. So I had a friend who was born in Germany, but of Turkish descent, who was fluent in Turkish and German. I said, let's go back and talk to these guys. And I just thought that they, you know, they, uh, they talked about, there was three guys, and they talked about how they had kept pigeons in Turkey. I researched it when I got home and saw that it's extraordinarily popular, was historically to keep pigeons in Turkey. And that for these guys, and so I decided that um, I wanted to go back and write more about these guys. So like, there's other dudes that do this. And so I, came, I went back and came to know this group of 26 men who are all men again, who are immigrants from Turkey, and you know, Germany has a lot of these, came over as guest workers and the like, 
who fly pigeons, and a particular breed of pigeons called Turkish tumblers, which are from Turkey, it's a particular Turkish breed. And that what was really neat to me was, um, and a nice contrast to New York. So in New York, there's this interesting story where the pigeons wind up being this mechanism by which people form these cross-racial ties and kind of mutes ethnocentrism. But here it is all about ethnocentrism. They say, this reminds me of my homeland. You know, these are Turkish breeds. The Anatolian sultans, soldiers, and you know, kept pigeons. And so this was a way for them to reinforce, hold on to, reinscribe their ethnic identity. And so that to me was really interesting is this contrast case for how these relationships and animals reinforce ethnic identity and ethnocentrism, if you will. Um, and so that so that that's kind of what it was about there. And then um, London and Venice came about because um, you know, New York there I kind of was writing about this tension between there's this war against pigeons, but then there's also people that feed them and kind of see them as an amenity. So I picked the two extremes. Venice uh, had this celebration of the pigeons in Piazza San Marco, the licensed vendors and everything. London, Chicago Square used to have that. And then by the time that I was writing, Mayor Ken Livingston had criminalized pigeon feeding, had put the falconer in there to walk around and keep them away. And Paris Hilton famously got a 100 pound citation for feeding the pigeons. Um, and, and so there was like this visible war against them. So they were kind of the two extremes of this tension. And so that, and so I already kind of told you the, the Venice and London stories in particular on, on the walk, but like that Venice, they could become inscribed with this immense cultural meaning that make people want to feed them. It's part of the Venetian experience. And cleaning them up in London becomes part of this larger political project of getting rid of panhandlers and trash and disorder. Um, and the final piece to this is that, um, you know, one of the things that I, that I saw in the Bronx was all the guys were like, you know, this, this is the poor man's horse racing. Anybody can do this if you just have some pigeons and a box. But yet, it wasn't true anymore. Um, that any of the guys who were competing and winning were buying pigeons. Some of them were importing them from Belgium. Um, that it was $100 per bird to enter, and if you're entering 40 birds, that's not nothing. You have to at least be, like, solid working class, like, like, unionized working class to be able to do that. And they were. Most of these guys were firemen, uh, steam fitters, cops, that kind of thing. Um, and one of the big interesting things I saw was that, and this, there was this, a lot of people lamented this even as they participated in it. it was being, and I said, well, I wondered, why is it being professionalized? Where is this pressure coming from? And where it's coming from is the rise of these international races. So there's the Vegas Classic. There's the Sun City Million Dollar Pigeon Race in, 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 in South Africa, where somebody, I don't know who, what, what, I don't remember or recall what the first race was, but somebody was like, OK, so pigeon racing is bounded geographically. right? You have, to be, you have to live in the Bronx to be a part of the Bronx Club. You race against other people in the Bronx. Um, and that makes sense because you want the pigeons to all fly more or less the same distance. The way they solve the problem of if you live in the South Bronx and I live in the North Bronx and they're flying from Virginia, yours would get home first, is it's not the first pigeon home, it's speed, which is distance by time, right? And then they clock it with the bands on the legs. So that velocity over an eight hour flight, flying those extra two miles won't really make the difference in velocity, right? But it means that the person in New York can't fly against the person in California, right? So somebody came up with this genius idea. What if you ship all the pigeons when they're young to one place, they imprint on that place, and then, they, and then you have a race amongst them, people from all over the world can send their pigeons there. So this is, and so the million dollar pigeon race is the biggest one, it's the biggest prize. Uh, the prize isn't actually a million dollars, it's a million dollars total payout, although now we're like one and a half million. So the, t the first prize is 200,000, whatever. And so what's happened is, is some of the guys in local clubs all around the world have started bypassing, why would I send my best pigeon to my local club when I can send it to the million dollar pigeon race, right? And so this is, so what happened was these local clubs started saying we have to have races with higher stakes to entice people to want to still race locally. The local clubs are being decimated by, by the, and so that was kind of what led, you know, and so I went to the Million Dollar Pigeon Race, and, and one of the things that I find interesting about it is um, when you disconnect it in this way, um, you really take away a lot of what pigeon racing is. So you're not training the pigeons anymore. A paid person in Sun City is training them while you're at your desk job here in Manhattan or whatever else, right? Um, they're not flying home to your roof. They're flying home to a casino. So the race in the coop is at a casino in Sun City, which is South Africa's equivalent of Las Vegas. Um, and you 
sit in a uh, arena in the casino and watch on a jumbotron. They have cameras fixed on the coop, but you're not allowed at the coop, and you watch on a jumbotron as they come in. And so really what was fascinating to me was people, you become entirely alienated from the craft of pigeon racing. You're not training them anymore. You're not waiting on your rooftop anymore um, at all. You can win a heck of a lot more money. Um, the other thing it means, which then just becomes like horse racing or anything else, is you don't actually have to be a pigeon racer to race pigeons. So people buy shares in somebody else's pigeon, right? So you can, and, and you can go, and you can see it advertised, like, oh, I'm gonna put $300 share in this breeder's pigeon. And, and then you can, of course, bet money as well. Um, and so it's really just become uh, this thing that's just any other form of gambling. Um, the pigeons themselves are almost not relevant to what's happening. Uh, most people go to a pigeon race and don't actually see a living pigeon, um, you know, well, for the whole race. All right, so I think we can continue asking questions, you know, in a more make believe sort of way. But um, I want to do one quick thing, which is, although you did commit eight years of your life, or whatever it is, to pigeons, there is more to you than that. And yes. um, when we met you, you had just come back from Pennsylvania, so I just thought it would be interesting to hear oh, thank quick. you what you've been up to and what your next topic is. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I have a joint appointment at NYU in Sociology and Environmental Studies. I mean, my PhD is in Sociology, but uh, I wound up for this bizarre project I did, writing a lot about urban ecology and animals and nature. And so that put me in Environmental Studies, uh, as in addition to Sociology. Since being in Environmental Studies, I've become a lot more interested in environmental issues more generally. Uh, so, I'm from Pennsylvania, and so I've been watching what's happening in Pennsylvania with fracking, with natural gas extraction, uh, which, as some of you may know, there's a moratorium in New York at the moment, so there's no drilling. But Pennsylvania, it's a free-for-all, to be blunt, I mean, pretty much. Um, so, I decided that uh, I wanted to go live in a community where shale gas extraction is happening, and to just understand, so I lived to, to understand how it's impacting communities, the good and the bad. Places that are more or less in the Rust Belt, where this potentially provides a lifeline for releasing your property or jobs where there wasn't much opportunity. Uh, but also for a lot of people, uh, potential corruption of the rural way of life, which makes living there enjoyable because it's really an industrialization of you know, a rural environment. Uh, issues of the fracking lottery, so a lot of people lease their land and make some money, but the real money comes if you get a well pad that they drill underneath you. So how it affects neighbor relations where your neighbor got the well pad and you didn't. So they made a bunch of money, but you get the traffic, the noise, whatever else, and how that affects relationships among neighbors. Uh, I'm also, I also am writing a lot about drilling in state forests. So many, almost every state where they allow fracking, the state is actually leased the state forest for drilling. And uh, so I did a bunch of job, like I did a bunch of trail maintenance and like basically ride alongs with foresters that drive around the forest and manage the tensions between drilling and recreational uses of the parks. And so uh, I just got back, I haven't started writing anything yet, I'm just trying to piece it all together. But it's basically a study of how shale gas extraction is changing communities and the rural environment. All right, stay tuned.